Hello. Hey, hey, Jason. How's it going? It's good. Sorry, I just adjusted my mic. It probably scratched. All right, fine. We're I not, wanted. To... We're not professionals here. No, we are far from. <laughs> I got this. Uh, I redid my my desk setup. So, like, my I got my chair at like Office Depot a few years ago, and it was like big and tall chair because I am big and tall. And but it had like plastic wheels on it, and they kept breaking off. And so I ordered these rollerblade wheels, and they are awesome. What what is it like rollerblade wheels? So they're rollerblade wheels, like you know, like the little rubber wheels. Uh-huh. Uh, and then they have like the proper size mount to go into my chair. Oh. So I literally just swapped them out and rolling around like the old days. Huh, that's awesome. I uh, just the other day I was thinking about redoing my like desk setup. It's been about this way for a year and a half now or something. And, you know, at some point you just kind of get tired of sitting in that position or whatever and need a little change. So I may do the same thing and move furniture around and just have a different setup in the next couple weeks. I think that'd be nice. I, I was about to go crazy. Like I was looking at like the like really expensive chairs and then i was like well i don't hate my chair i just hate that it like falls over when i sit down in it surely that's an easy fix yeah you don't need to spend a thousand dollars for a new (laughs) miller for that right uh the other thing i did was i got one of those monitor mounts for my imac Uh, so i try not to slouch as much so I like lifted my monitor up and I like it. I was scared my IKEA desk was gonna like snap in half. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah. Anything good? Oh, Stripe FCA is the opposite of that. Um, mm. You know, I mean, you're dealing with some of the Stripe stuff too, and we complained about that last time at Southeast Ruby. <laughs> I complain about it every day. You're getting closer to being launched with that, right? Yeah, I have it all, air quotes, done as much as like the edge cases I can think of. So I'm hoping it'll go out next week. Cool. Yeah, you're going to deploy on a Friday, right? <laughs> yeah, I uh, I was rolling out API upgrades. We talked about this earlier. Like I would do like a few at a, like one at a time. And then today I just rolled them all out. I was like, YOLO. So... <laughs> That's funny. Well, um, today we're joined by uh, Jacob Harrington. Uh, Welcome. You want to give yourself an introduction for us? Sure. Uh, Hey, Chris and Jason. Thanks for having me. I'm Jacob. Um, Yeah, I'm a Ruby developer as well. And I also was at Southeast Ruby. It was the first time I had met Chris in person, but Jason and I had bumped into each other at an open source conference previously. Cool. What uh, conference was that? Uh, that was Southeast Solidist was the name. So Solidist is an open source like e-commerce platform that I'm on the core team of. So I went to that conference. Uh, I think it was last year um, in Memphis and Jason gave a talk. So I said hello to him and, and got to know him. It was a pretty small conference, about 50 or 100 people. Cool. Yeah, it was uh, It's good to meet you at Southeast Ruby this year. It's fun to you know, every year is just kind of an awesome group of new people to meet. So, and especially at a small conference like that, we get to, mm-hmm. you know, kind of meet more people than you would otherwise. Like at RailsConf, there's just so many people. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, so uh, I'm be curious to, you know, hear your background on how you got into coding and stuff. And then, you know, I feel like we should talk about Solidus because, uh, there's a lot of, you know, I see Spree and Solidus come up pretty regularly um, in conversations about Rails and e-commerce and stuff. So um, that's something we've, I don't think we've ever really talked about on the show at all. So uh, I'd love to go into that. I've used Spree uh, six or seven years ago for like a client project that was already mm-hmm. set up with Spree. So like it. I don't have a whole lot of experience with it, but uh, yeah, if you want to in, in, like go through your background and, and, you know, tell us how you got into coding and all that. Sure. Yeah. So, so 
right now on paper, I'm a senior engineer. I don't really feel that way. My story is pretty short. Um, but I, I, I benefit from the kind of stereotypical, like I started messing with computers when I was really young. I think really young. I like the, the time period for me is different than a lot of people. Cause I'm, I'm still pretty young. Um, but when I was still in elementary school, I guess, uh, we had a windows 95 computer and like we played games and stuff on that. And that was like my relationship with, with computers until I was 12 or so was, was playing video games. Um, and then I got, uh, my parents bought me a laptop, uh, and it was a really crappy laptop. I actually, it may have been my dad's like old work laptop that was getting thrown away or something. But anyways, I had a laptop and the first thing I ever wrote, <laughs> the first piece of software I ever wrote was in visual basic. And, uh, I played runescape when I was in like middle school or however old it was. <laughs> and I made a thing to like, uh, in RuneScape, when you wanted to sell something, you had to like type over and over again what you were selling, like the price you wanted to sell it for. And you could like use, you know, different macros and stuff, but I didn't know what I was doing. So I wrote a Visual Basic like chat spam thing that would repeat phrases. And I followed some tutorial online. And what I actually built, I didn't know this at the time, what I actually built was a like a flooding thing designed to crash chat rooms. So the first thing I ever built was malware. So that's really cool. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I was like 12. I had no idea what I was doing. And I copy and pasted out some tutorial. And then from that point forward, I didn't really do any software development that you could speak of. I played around with HTML and CSS. I made a couple like what I hesitate to call websites um, throughout my my like young adulthood or into my young adulthood. But I think around 16 or 17, um, I got involved with this program that's in Arkansas, where I'm from, uh, that put students like on paid projects that are supposed to be facilitated by technology. And so we had these these projects that were really cool in retrospect. Uh, like we worked for the, the Library of Congress and we worked for uh, some environmental groups and they, they paid us. So we, I think in my time there, I was involved in raising like over a quarter million dollars in grant money to these projects. Um, as high schoolers, which is really crazy. But part of that was we did a lot of like creative stuff. And some of that was like WordPress development, maybe, but like a lot of video editing and and kind of graphic design. And so I ended up kind of falling into this role of like student IT administrator of all the software we had uh, in that classroom. And so I got into like Windows Server and then I started doing a little bit of WordPress and a little bit of like very basic like PowerShell stuff. Um, and I didn't really have any goals of becoming a software developer. So after that, uh, my senior year of high school, I was in PE uh, by accident. I don't know why I was in PE, but I showed up and I was like, I'm not doing this. This is ridiculous. I did track and cross country for six years, so I don't need this PE credit. And uh, I went and complained in the, the admin office or whatever at school. And the only class they could move me into was uh, a Java class. So like by, by sheer coincidence, I got put in that class. Um, and it happened to be with one of my best friends of all time was like the, and it was also the only open seat in the class was next to him. So it was like just total serendipity, but I, <clears throat> I got introduced to Java and that was cool. And so I went through that class and I had a really good time. And then I went to college. And when I went to college, I had decided that I was going to join my, my family's pretty military heavy. My brother's uh, a veteran. And uh, I decided that I was going to join the Air Force and I was going to go through ROTC. So I actually became a computer science major specifically because it was attractive to the Air Force. They wanted those majors. Um, and so I studied computer science for all of a couple semesters and realized that there was no way I was going to get through the, the math prerequisites. So I changed into like a business major and I stayed in ROTC until at one point I got hurt lifting weights and I kind of had the choice. I could either uh, one, I, I could lie and say that I didn't have the injury I had, um, which was very easy to do. And I had the opportunity to do uh, two, I could get surgery and that would be fine. The Air Force was cool with it, but it would reset my kind of uh, cadet training uh, track a couple years or a year. So I'd have to repeat a year of college and ROTC, which didn't sound super fun. Uh, or I could, you know, quit and do something else. And I had this meeting with a guy who was on the, what they call the cadre in ROTC. So this is captain who had been in the air force for eight or nine years. And he told me that, uh, he had, cause I, I kind of presented this conundrum to him and said, these are my options. And he told me that he 
regretted spending the time he spent in the Air Force, not because he it wasn't valuable, but because he was really passionate about coffee and he had wanted to start a coffee company, uh, like be a roaster. And he had made zero progress on that goal because uh, in his mind, I think because of the Air Force. So he told me if, if I didn't want to be in the Air Force for 20 years and I wasn't dead set on doing that, then uh, I should I should quit the program. So I did. Um, that pretty much sold me. And uh, that was interesting for me because I went into this kind of this. I still wasn't a programmer. I still hadn't written software for money yet at this point. Um, so I kind of fell into this like, what am I going to do now? I'm sort of depressed. I stopped going to school more or less. Um, and then I, I, I kind of got out of that. I said, OK, I'm going to. During that time, I had moved back home and was like living with my parents. And this was only like six months that this happened. But I, I decided I was going to make the best of it. And I was going to go try to find uh, a good internship and like learn a skill. So I started like cold calling people. And one of the places I called was JB Hunt Transportation, which is this corporation with like tens of, I don't know how many thousands of employees, but but it's a huge corporation. And it's like trucking and transportation. And I got an internship in their IT program because I knew how to build computers because I had built PCs for gaming. And, and so I went to this hardware IT program and turns out all the other interns in that IT program were computer science majors and all wanted to be programmers. So I kind of, by osmosis, started to learn about software engineering. Uh, and then as I, went back to, I went back to school at this point and I was a business major and I, I decided I wanted to build startups. So I started to, after about a year and a half at JBON, I started to cold call CEOs in my area and stuff and say, I want to get coffee with you or I want to, I want to be mentored by you. So let's meet up. And then like, turns out if you go to people who don't have to ask someone else to hire you, uh, you get lots of job offers. If you become friends with CEOs and like CTOs. So I, I started to do that and I started getting all these internship offers. People were like, oh, you're a really smart kid. We want you to come work for us. And like, we see you as potentially becoming somebody we want to hire full time because basically you're just showing the initiative of tracking down these people. Um, so I started doing that at, at startups and I actually quit school and I didn't tell people uh, at the time, but I was doing like, th like two or three internships at a time and not telling anybody that I wasn't in college anymore. And I was learning how to build uh, startups. And a huge part of that became, I was like, Hey, I understand this IT stuff. I understand like a little bit about technology. Um, I can figure out how to automate these dumb tasks that you guys are doing and you can't afford to do because you're startups. And so I started getting these like Python and PHP, like little tasks to do. And that, that was like a really important period for me because that was where I decided, okay, I'm going to double down on this. I'm going to start spending all of my free time, you know, on free code camp or whatever else and learn JavaScript and learn web development. And then through the grapevine, fast forward a year or two of doing that, um, I got called by a recruiter out of the blue and offered to interview for this job at a rail shop. And that rail shop happened to be one of the best rail shops in our area. So I did it and I had this crazy interview process where they did like these panel interviews and one of them had like over over a dozen people in the panel. That was a whole, the whole engineering team. Uh, and through this process, I kept telling them, like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not a good software engineer. I don't know Ruby. Don't hire me to work on your Rails product. Uh, but they hired me anyways. So long story short. And that team then experienced massive turnover over the next year. And I kind of felt like I was left holding this hot potato. And I went through this terrible period of imposter syndrome. And then, you know, long, long, really long story and really painful story short, um, I realized it was the environment making me feel that way. And then I made a change. And now it's kind of where I'm at now. I'm, I'm a few years past that. I'm working in startups and stuff. And I, I'm stepping out of my shell and like being really honest about the the struggles that I had early on. But, you know, I'm still in the very early stages of my career. So uh, that's a really long and roundabout way of saying like, I didn't intend to be a programmer really. And I kind of fell into this, but it was also a very powerful uh, journey for me where I, I became a lot more comfortable with myself and I, I learned to like handle this really terrible imposter syndrome that I experienced in the first year of my, my career. That's awesome. Um, you know, it's funny cause like I went through computer science and got a degree, but like most of the stuff that we learned was things that I like 
taught myself ahead of time and we get mm-hmm. to our computer labs and stuff and it was like read a file and write out <laughs> another file and it was like this is absolutely awful like why am i paying thousands of dollars to learn this mm-hmm. but then you know i i get to my first job interview and oh man i can't remember i i, I can pretty clearly remember how how like worried i was um but like I walk in and it's me and this other guy who's walking me through the interview process. And then all of a sudden, like 12 other people walk in for the interview and I didn't know this. And they all are sitting on this big conference table facing me. And it's like me versus all of them. And they're throwing questions at me like, you know, go up to the whiteboard and design this database. um, And we're going to just tell you the problem. And like, Mm. I had extreme imposter syndrome then because like the only database stuff I knew was from like fiddling with WordPress and like we didn't have any database courses that were required in our computer science degree. Like as ridiculous Mm -hmm. as that sounds, no networking, um, no databases required, no web development at all. And, you know, even having paid and gone through a computer science degree, like, you still come out of that feeling the same way in a lot of cases. Like, yeah, there's some things that you feel a little bit better because you went through some, some structure, but like, yeah, it is those, that first time that you get a job is like extremely scary. Mm -hmm. It's pretty crazy. I've talked a lot about on the show, like dropping out for similar reasons. Like math was always a problem for me. I think just because I didn't like apply myself to it, but that doesn't matter anymore. Um, but I always like kind of thought, uh, like, Oh, like I won't need this. Right. And I don't think I've ever shared this, but like, I'm actually grateful for the little bit of time I spent in computer science because at my last job I interviewed, they offered it to me and then I turned it down and then I changed my mind. Uh, (laughs) so like I went, I went back like a month later and I was like, Hey, you know, like, I, I do want to talk about that. They're like, okay, cool. But we hired a new, like, lead engineer. Uh, so you'll have to interview with her. And so, like, I just went in, like, okay, this will just be, like, a casual conversation. <laughs> and her first question was, like, what are the three fundamentals of object-oriented programming? And I was like, shit. <laughs> uh, but at least I knew that stuff because I spent a little time studying computer mm-hmm. science. Yeah. Jacob, how were your interviews that first time? Like, did they ask you questions like that? Or were you, you know, in a more, I guess, what I think would be a better kind of interview, not asking lots of those, like, you know, computer science-y questions? Yeah, so I I don't want to accuse anybody of anything. So I don't want to say, like, what I think they were doing in this interview process, but... Um, I have suspicions about why I was hired and like whether or not it was totally ethical. Um, but anyways, I was, I was, I went through what I considered to be kind of an insane interview process for that job. I had two phone screenings. Um, and then I had my first interview with, uh, uh, some people that I'm still friends with one of them. Um, and he's a great software engineer, but, uh, they basically sat me down and it was called like the technical interview, the technical screen or something. But we just talked through like, my experience programming, which at that point was basically nothing. I was like, yeah, yeah, I've written some Python and I've used pandas to do some like data cleansing. And I know at that point I had really actually done a lot of SQL. So I, I know a little bit about databases and I, I had written huge amounts of SQL. Um, so that interview was pretty lax and that was a technical one. The next one was kind of the craziest of them. They brought the entire engineering team in, which I don't know exactly how many people it was, but it was more than 12 and they like panel interviewed me which was super stressful um and again it wasn't technical questions and i I also during these interviews more than once in more than one interview i said like verbatim i don't know rails i've never written ruby don't hire me like i basically (laughs) told them not to hire me more than once um and then after that i went into what they called a culture fit interview where they brought someone from each like business unit of the company. So you had someone from marketing there, someone from, you know, uh, IT or engineering, whichever. Um, and then a person from sales and they had like account managers and stuff because they had, it was kind of an ad based company. Um, 
it was that influencer marketing company. And they, uh, they just asked me questions about like my opinions on these really esoteric things that were supposed to determine whether or not I would fit in. So it was a little weird. Um, I didn't feel a ton of imposter syndrome because, uh, I was, I didn't go in being like, I have to get this job. It was kind of just a spur of the moment. Sure. I'll interview kind of thing. I felt imposter syndrome throughout the year following where I worked there. And I describe imposter syndrome there. I talk, I've, I've given a talk on it, but like, I think imposter syndrome is, I, I, I never want to say, I don't think people feel it because that's not fair to say. And I, I can't know that, but I think people conflate the idea of anxiety and imposter syndrome a lot. And imposter syndrome, I think it's really important to note that like the word syndrome is in there. Um, it's it's not something like you're like, oh man, I feel anxious about this. It's like every day I wake up and I have a panic attack and I think about how people at work are going to find out that I don't belong there and I'm going to get fired really publicly and never be able to get a job again because all these people are going to tell everybody that they know that this one weird dude got fired at their job. Um, so I had that really bad. Uh, and, and it wasn't during the interview process. It was later as I, like, I basically failed to perform the job because the environment around me was like, everyone's jumping ship and there's no one here to provide mentorship. Um, so it was, it was weird, but the interview process itself, I, I still think of as being like a over the top interview that ultimately created at this company, a monoculture where I didn't fit in because I wasn't, I wasn't of the same cloth as everyone there. Hmm. That's interesting. So, uh, over time, like, how did you feel about your imposter syndrome? Did that get better? Did um, you have to, like, you know, switch jobs or something? Um, <laughs> yeah. How did that go? Yeah. So it never went away, right? You don't really get away from imposter syndrome. Like, it's, there's always one, one, there's always a scar from it. And two, like, you're always going to have some level of um, anxiety about your ability to perform in your job. Uh, but the thing that, the thing that, helped what i changed environments the environment itself was conducive and, and i had been there for so long and felt this way for so long there after a year that like i wasn't just going to get away from that feeling like being there made me feel that way because it reminded me of all the times that i felt that way there um so i did have to leave and go somewhere else to kind of get over it but the thing that really helped and really changed like my perspective was just telling people i had imposter syndrome just saying like oh man i don't know anything about that. And I feel like all you guys do. And it makes me feel like I don't belong here. Like being honest about things like that. Um, and also mentoring another person. So when I went to my next job, I was hired alongside a guy who had never had a development job before. And he's, he's a really wonderful, uh, like UX engineer now. Um, but at the time, like he didn't know very much. So my entire job basically was to sit with him and work on stuff together with him. And he taught me stuff about CSS cause he's really good at that. But like, I had to teach him how anything in Rails worked or how things in JavaScript worked or how Git worked. Any of those things I had to, to teach him. So I had to learn them. Um, and that helped me feel a lot more secure in my knowledge that there was someone here who knew less than me and I could help. So, so those two things combined, like having an example of someone who did know less than me so I didn't feel like I was the, the worst person on the team, like I did at that first, that first job. And then also um, just being honest and saying, yeah, I feel this way and, and doing that very publicly. Got, kind of got rid of a lot of those what I, the, the symptoms that I would say made it into a syndrome where I felt it every day like really strongly. I think it's interesting when you said like you were mentoring someone, but also like there were things you didn't know and you had to go look up. Sure, because a lot a lot of that for me was like as time went on, you know, like I was still learning and like really. I don't know what the word I'm looking for. I had a lot of drive to like learn outside of work too. Mm -hmm. And like that definitely helped. Uh, and I don't know. I think that like with imposter syndrome, just being in software developer, being in software development, like longer and longer does kind of help with that. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah. I think for me, it also was just realizing that everyone else feels this way. Fair enough. Yeah. It's interesting. Like it brings me back to the early days of, of go rails. Actually, like I, uh, just like no one knew who I was or anything. And, and I started go rails because I just wanted to like start a product and not do consulting. And 
you know, I didn't really think I knew Rails well, but at that point, I had worked with a you know few beginner Rails people and had kind of just explained stuff to them and and helped them learn some some basics. So I like started to record a few videos just kind of for anyone who's super duper new. And I felt that way about like trying to record these videos and teach people because it was like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like I've only <laughs> been doing Rails for a couple of years. Like why would I ever be qualified enough to teach this stuff? And then there was like a whole other level too that was like, I don't, I can't even stand listening to my own voice uh, mm -hmm. and I'm super monotone and like all these things that were so bad to the point that it took me three months to record, I think 15 videos that were, mm -hmm. you know, five minutes long or whatever. And I had to get to a point where I would sit down, think about what I was going to record and then I would just not do it. So I had to force myself to record 15 minutes every day and just throw it away afterwards. It was like, I don't care if I don't, don't use this. As long as I sit down and record for 15 minutes, then like at least I did it and I'll get more comfortable over time. And I, it took a long time, you know, because the second that I put stuff up for sale, people were like, this isn't worth any money. Why would you charge nine dollars for these videos? Like you don't even have people hardly any that. videos. And what's that? Did people actually say that? Oh yeah! Like the second that I, I bet they're still on the website in the comments section. Well, oh. maybe not. Uh, they were all all in the old discuss comments. But yeah, like you know, I, I originally tried to sell it as a course, um, and then of course no one buys it. So I was like, I'll, I'll change to this sort of. Ryan Bates Railscast model because people did like that and I subscribed to that so maybe they'd feel more comfortable subscribing and oh yeah like half the comments or more were like you don't even have any content why would I give you nine dollars <laughs> and it was like a real struggle for me because it took me literally like nine months to get to that point um, that first year where I would like created some stuff for these courses, changed them to being these weekly videos. And I was like, I don't even know if I want to commit to recording a video every week and then someone's going to subscribe. And, you know, now I have to deliver stuff. It was a mess of emotions that first year. Um, and it was just a strange, you know, experience. But now that I've done it for so long, it feels fine. But it sure was awful at the beginning, you know, and I feel like it was just like a a thing when you're putting yourself out there and people are like judging you, like when you're getting a job and you aren't sure you can do the work there, you feel like it's just like you're under a microscope and they're judging you personally. And it's probably not necessarily quite the case. And like, I felt that doing screencasts, but like, you know, it's, some people, most of those people weren't learning anything from my videos, the people who would complain, but the people mm -hmm. who did learn something, I noticed and they were like, whoa, could you do more on this? And they didn't care about the quality. And I started to notice that. And it, it was over time easier to ignore those, you know, haters just because they're on the internet. <sighs> I don't know. That's yeah. like a whole nother level of imposter syndrome. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's a whole reason like... I never want to put content out. It's like, I'm so like, I'm not thick skinned. Like I can't do that. So mm -hmm. props to you. It also still gets to me all the time, all the time. Like, you know, a bug comes up in Hatchbox, which happens constantly. And I'm always like, do I even like, do I even know Linux and Ruby well enough to, you know, build a hosting thing like it's been this long and it's still broken all the time you know uh, it just yeah it is something you get a little bit better at deflecting but it still hits you pretty continuously yeah i mean i've i've started uh in the last like two weeks i've started like blogging really aggressively and it's it's had a lot of you know benefits on the, the podcast that i made right so uh it's two two sets of content that i'm producing but i've had a lot of success i think 
I don't know like what other people think, but for me personally, it's been really good and really healthy for a lot of my content to be about the fact that I like don't know what I'm doing where I, I just kind of honestly say like, I'm new at this industry and like I need advice or I feel imposter syndrome. So I want to know how you deal with it. And that has resulted in not being afraid what other people think. Cause I'm kind of taking that weapon away from them by saying like, I already feel this way. So like, if you tell me that I don't know what I'm doing, I'm going to agree with you. Like, <laughs> it's not going to surprise me at all. That's really good. I'm, uh, I'd like to shift gears a little bit. If that's cool. Yeah. Um, you mentioned we met at Southeast Solidus. So I knew of Spree. Um, I heard of Solidus. My friend, Jeremy works with, uh, I think, you, I mean, obviously Sean who put on Southeast Solidus. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's like, I've learned a lot about it from that, but how did you get into Solidus? And for those who don't know, do you mind kind of explaining what Solidus is? Yeah. So Solidus is, um, the fastest way to explain it because more people know what Spree is, is that Solidus is a fork of Spree. But, uh, if you don't know what Spree is, then Solidus is an e-commerce platform that, um, is built, uh, on top of this code base that at one point was Spree, which sort of went. If you look into the history of the of the Spree repository, you'll see there's like a two year period where it sort of went derelict, and during that period, Solidus kind of came out and uh, became sort of where most of the the Spree developers went to. So it's you know that doesn't really explain what it is, but it, it's kind of its history. Um, it's actually an open source e commerce platform, so you can kind of take it. You you do sort of need to be a developer to use it, but you can kind of take it out of the box and have you know eighty percent of the functionality of, of any e commerce platform that you're going to want so if you're if you're trying to build an e-commerce site and you want to sell like dropship t-shirts you probably don't want solidus you you want shopify or something um but if you're going to build something more complex like uh for example glossier is on it uh jewel is on it uh there's a company called floyd they ship furniture so they have like a pretty complex uh system for their supply chain and uh solidus helps them with that so they're on solidus uh just stuff like that it's 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 a, a very it's an open source e-commerce platform that's very battle tested. Um, and kind of to answer the question of how I got involved, um, it's it's weird. So I, I left that one job and I went to go work for this entrepreneur in our uh, area down here. I live in Arkansas and there's a guy here named John James who's sort of well known for being really good at raising money and like building big companies. And, and he's done that a couple times. So I, I heard that he was building a new company that had like, you know, a handful of employees. So I went to get coffee with them and just asked them for a job. Um, and so he hired me uh, and I went to join this company and we're, we're building an e-commerce platform. So something to compete with like Magento or WooCommerce uh, and maybe potentially eventually Shopify. Um, it's, it's some, it's, it's supposed to be a more develop, developer oriented e-commerce platform. So we took Solidus as like the, the, kind of pillar we started building on top of. And it's kind of the uh, the way to describe it now. At this point, we've evolved quite a bit past Solidus and it's sort of like it's the nervous system. So all the things that e-commerce platforms have to do, it's like kind of boring. Like how does a refund work and how does, you know, uh, somebody actually check out? What is a cart? Those kind of questions. Uh, we, we lean on Solidus to answer those. And then we build features on top of that. And they didn't actually tell me to go work on Solidus. They told me like, Oh, you might want to be familiar with this thing because it's related. But I kind of took that as an open invitation because I really wanted to get involved in open source anyways to just start making PRs. Um, and I wrote a blog post about this. It's really clickbaity, but people can find it if they find me online somewhere. I'm sure you'll bounce into it. Uh, called how I made or how open source made me ten thousand dollars working part time or something. Um, but the backstory is that I I. Uh, I made these like really small PRs that didn't seem significant to me, but I made a lot of them. And I started doing like really boring tasks that were easy that the maintainers didn't want to do, but were important. Um, and I, I, again, I did this without like really any encouragement from the people I worked for. And over like six months, uh, they started to kind of notice me in that project and said, you know, we would love to have you come join this private stakeholders group we have where you can kind of represent how you use Solidus and help us steer the, steer the platform. And I did that. And then I got more and more involved. And then that eventually became, we want you to join the core team. 
Um, so it was like, it's really a long roundabout, like six to eight month process where I just made all these honestly boring patches to the, to the platform. Uh, I didn't add any cool features or anything. I just did stuff that I thought was helpful. And that ended up being those, the, that's what a maintainer does. A maintainer doesn't do like the cool features and stuff. They just keep the platform like stable and they improve the documentation and they make sure that, you know, the test coverage works and the upgrade path is easy. So just doing those things ended up turning me into one of the maintainers. That's really awesome. Um, I know that sort of the same path goes with, you know, the rails core team. If anyone's ever dreamt of joining that, it's kind of, you know, stay on the PRs, answer questions and whatever, and help out while you can. Um, but I'm curious about the, like, sort of the stakeholder stuff. Cause I know that rails kind of gets that with GitHub and Shopify, uh, you know, pulling features from their production stuff and pulling that into rails. We're seeing mm-hmm. that with, you know, the action tech stuff, file uploads, uh, multiple databases. Um, how does that work for Solidus? That's really cool thing to be a part of. I'm sure it kind of feels like a secret club that you're in. <laughs> yeah, it was that way at first, for sure. Um, so if you go to solidus.io slash community, there's a kind of a breakdown and I think also slash partners. There's kind of a breakdown of how that works. But basically, uh, there was a company that was leading the Solidus project and was the original group of people that forked uh, from Spree. And that company got purchased by Jewel. Um, and they kind of stepped away from the platform. So not entirely, but largely. And they, they didn't run it anymore. Um so another agency that's based in Italy called Nebulab, and they're they're awesome guys. They uh, their founders are awesome guys, anyways. They uh, decided to kind of take on the mantle of leading the project, and and Engine, the company I work for, has also taken on that role um, to a lesser degree. But what we basically did was we lost this directional company, and we tried to replace them with like this kind of sort of republic or democratic system where we brought in represent representatives from the companies we knew relied on Solidus, And we just kind of used them as, as a data point when we made decisions. So we said, you know, we, we want to do these things. Well, how does the community feel about this? And, you know, 20 people from the companies we knew were relying on the platform said, this is how we feel. And we took votes. And then eventually now it's much more formalized and it's, it's a system where, um, you can join it basically by either being really actively or an active contributor. Uh, we'll, we'll get you on it or you can choose to like back the project financially. If you're a company that can't spend the time, we have a couple agencies that their money is less valuable than their time to them. So they just back us financially and that's their way of showing support. Um, and those people get to come in and they can, they can join, uh, you know, the stakeholder group that we use to, I mean, the right way to put it, I guess, is to to test our our ideas against and to and to pull you know a roadmap out of. They they give us the roadmap and tell us what needs to be added. So it's it's a really cool uh, concept and it's kind of unique to us. Uh, we we sort of have cobbled together the way we want it because it was it was built out of necessity and then it became kind of a cultural thing that as a project we do. So it's very it's very unique to us, but. It, we definitely took inspiration from other other projects. Yeah, that's cool. Do you run into conflicts? What or is it kind of? A, I mean, if you're maintaining stuff and someone's asking for like a, you know, tangential feature or whatever, mm-hmm. probably most of the time you can be like, yeah, just go build your extension on your own or whatever. But I'm I'm curious if it adds complexity to to things as well. Well, the barrier to entry. Uh, to kind of join the stakeholder team, in my opinion, uh, really vets out people that are going to be uh, either ignorant of how open source software is built or just are going to have like unrealistic demands. You kind of have to to get behind the project a little bit to, to be in that team, in that group. So either you've done development and you know what working on the project is like and you know what's realistic and what isn't, or uh, you're putting a significant amount of money into like, have a voice on that in that that group and in the same way you're you're trying to f- support the future of the project so gotcha. that gets rid of people who are like i demand this feature that's only useful to me 
But what it adds is like when someone says, I need this and like, we need this as a company. Now the core team knows like, this is what our key stakeholders need to keep using the platform. So we need to build it. So generally speaking, it's, it's not, I mean, if they say they need something, then, then that's what, where the platform needs to go because I mean, we, we vote and stuff. If someone gets outvoted 10 to one, then maybe we don't go that way. But if eight people are saying that we want this, that's where the platform needs to go. Cause that's what the community needs. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I mean, it seems like a lot of projects are not run that way. And I know from maintaining a bunch of open source stuff myself, like most of the time it's like, well, if I don't see it as a feature that most people need or whatever, then I'll just kind of uh, gloss over it. Or mm -hmm. if it's something that like is a project of mine that it's just like, I don't want to maintain this code. Uh, just simply for that reason, <laughs> sometimes I'll be like, nah, no thanks. Because mm -hmm. like you're you're free to contribute this feature, but I'm the one that has to support it forever. Yeah. And, you know, I think that happens a lot. But when you have like that level of commitment from your core like partners there, it ends up being uh, like much more collaborative because they have to give a, an investment uh, in order to get stuff back in return mm -hmm. or whatever. So it's not just the typical open source, hey, build this feature for me because I want it. And that that you see kind of the, you see those discussions on Hacker News and stuff all the time or whatever, but mm -hmm. um, it's neat to see that. I like that. Maybe more company or more, you know, projects like that will, will evolve in the future. It'd be neat to see maybe like, I don't know, like a feature on GitHub or something that could kind of use or in the organization to, to, I don't know, do, do that sort of meeting thing or whatever. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have like monthly meetings or, or? Yeah. So we do a uh, core team meeting happens every week. Um, but we do a stakeholder meeting every other week and it's about an hour long. And generally attendance is somewhere between 10 or five and 10 people, but we've had, you know, I think early on we had 18 people show up to one or something like that. So it can just be whoever has something to say shows up and then whoever's there, usually there's one or two core team members in the stakeholder meeting and they kind of weigh in on, on what comes up. That's cool. How long have you been on, um, well, I guess just involved in Solidus? Yeah, I've been involved for a little over a year. I've been on the core team for eight or nine months. Um, the, crazy thing about that is so I've only been writing software professionally for like, I mean, counting internships, like six or seven years, not counting internships, like a full-time software engineer for like maybe three years, um, maybe. And so if you measure that against the other people on the core team in Solidus, uh, a huge number of them, well, not anymore, a, a significant number of them, uh, at the time, one point in time, it was, you know, half of them were in, were running their own companies um and then the rest of them are very senior engineers so uh i think i would guess i'm the most junior by like 10 years of experience which is really interesting um like i i learned a ton just by being in the conversations they have mm -hmm. yeah just being around those people even if you can't contribute just listening and seeing what pe what questions people are asking or whatever just is almost invaluable um, mm -hmm. it's the same, you know, you want to be working with other people that are a lot smarter than you, which doesn't help your imposter syndrome, but <laughs> it, uh, you know, definitely does help like accelerate your learning. Cause having worked for myself and with only myself, uh, for the f past few years, like it is certainly a challenge when you want to if you want to learn something, you don't have anyone to discuss problems with. It's mm -hmm. much, much harder. And it feels like you learn slower. Like my, you know, original years programming were like just in my basement with my dad's like Atari programming book. And there's no one to teach you that you don't know uh, algebra yet, that programming is going to be a little bit harder and we <laughs> need to go learn that first, you know? So that is that awesome place to be, uh, do you have like advice on how people can, you know, get involved in other groups like that if they're wanting to find some other, 
you know, engineers or, or whatever, just to be a part of, uh, you know, uh, conversations with more experienced people if they don't necessarily have that at work or whatever? Yeah. So I've had the benefit of being on the open source uh, or being in the open source kind of ecosystem and being on that core team. But I've also helped to organize like three or four conferences this year, um, which has been kind of the same experience. And I also run my podcast, which is literally exactly that. Um, it is a way in which I get very senior people to sit down and talk with me for an hour. Um, so there's a lot of methods for doing that. Um, the thing that I, with respect to open source, like the thing that I advise people to do is kind of exactly what I did, which is go do boring stuff. Um, I, I am amazed uh, if if I ever see a PR that gets closed and the PR's ex- express purpose is to improve clarity of documentation or to uh, make tests a little better or more complete or um, like fix a, a CI configuration thing, things like that, those PRs never get closed. Um, and if they do, it's because the person who opened it is a jerk. Like it's not because the, the, the uh, change wasn't appreciated. Um, so I always tell people to do that kind of stuff. Go in. The first thing I do when I look at a new open source project, even if it's just one I'm curious about, is I open up their documentation and I copy and paste all of it into like uh, a, a, a some kind of text editor where I have like spell checking and stuff. And I just read it and I look for things I didn't understand or like typos. And I, I make a PR uh, that's just fixing typos and clarifying things that didn't make sense to me. And I've never had one of those PRs closed. They, they always get merged because it's just a boring thing that no one wants to do. And I'm going to read the documentation anyways. So I might as well be helpful while I'm there. So that's a big one with open source. It's just find ways to be helpful, even if it's like not cool. You don't need to build a new feature to be helpful. You can you can just fix small things. Um, and then obviously you want to graduate into like bug fixes. And then maybe eventually you want to add a feature. But if you just want to be helpful and just get involved and just get to know the people in the project, it's super easy to start out doing that. Um, you don't need to go out and do some Herculean task. Um, and then when it comes to like just getting involved with other developers, uh, and this ha- this works with people outside the development field, uh, just one, get comfortable with, with hearing no. If you're going to try to like, get in touch with a lot of people, like with my podcast, I think yesterday I sent a Twitter DM to somebody to ask if they wanted to be on my podcast and they just insta-blocked me. Um, like, be okay with that. That totally, that happens all the time. Um, and be comfortable with people being jerks to you, but then understand that like, you're never going to find mentors or like make new acquaintances or build your network. If you don't reach out to people and you don't try to do that. So that's, that's another one is like, just reach out to people, just ask, just say, Hey, I would love to grab coffee with you, or I would love to have your opinion on this. And then the, the last one's the easiest one is like, go to meetups and stuff just by showing up enough times, you'll eventually get to know people that can can mentor you and teach you and and give you that benefit. Um, That's how I got involved in organizing a couple of the conferences I worked on this year was just showing up to events and people being like, Oh, we see you around. So would you like to help us with this conference? Um, I mean, that's, that's pretty much it. It's just showing up. Like Southeast Ruby. Yeah. Like that one. I just bothered you and you were like, yeah, you can help review talks. (laughs) But yeah, I just came down to reaching out and saying, hey, I'll, I'll help out with this if I can. Yeah, so. uh, that reminds me of, uh, I think, Ryan Carson from Treehouse just like wanted to get involved in tech or whatever and just started his own conference. And that was like the way he met all these people and then eventually mm-hmm. you know, started Treehouse. So, yeah, I just that that's a great way to be able to contribute. And you don't have to start your own conference. You can go volunteer. <laughs> Yeah, every conference is going to be happy to have help. You know, for sure. There's so much, so much stuff that's going on there. Uh, even that's, the, oh, go ahead. Even the larger conferences need volunteers and help. Like, oh yeah, probably like more. Ruby Conf need volunteers. Like, there's plenty of ways to get involved, even at a large scale. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and like that's that's my what my podcast is. I've told people this before. A lot of people ask, uh, first off, I started my podcast. Jason was one of the first people I, I emailed about my podcast. I started it. Um, let me think. I think I started it on a Wednesday night and I, and I like had recorded two or three episodes by, you know, the ne- that following Monday. Um, because I, I just said, I want to meet these people. Uh, how can I meet them? Well, if I have a podcast, they're more likely to talk to me. So I just had this 
system of like, I want to talk to this person. I, I would love to get coffee with them for an hour and just bother them with questions. Well, they're willing to do it if they can record it. Because what happens is if you're, uh, Kent C. Dodds told me this, he was the first episode I ever posted. And he was a huge part of the reason why I, I have the, the podcast, like uh, the guests that I have, he referred a lot of people to me to come on my podcast. And he, uh, he told me immediately, if you had asked me to get coffee with you, I would have said no. Because I can't get coffee with a thousand people like every every week. Like if you take an hour of my time and like a thousand people do that, that's so much time. But if I record a conversation with you, every time someone asks me these questions, I can link them to your podcast. Like, and that's incredibly valuable to people that have large audiences and like want to help as many people as they can, but only have so much time. So that that literally informed me to say, okay, I know that. So I'm just gonna build a podcast and now I can meet all these people. And that's helped build my network. Like by an insane amount. I mean, that's how I met uh, how I met Chris. Or uh, part of the reason why, why Chris and I are, are we're talking right now is because I asked Chris to come on my podcast. Um, and that's not to say Chris wouldn't have spent an hour with me if I asked if, if we wanted to go get a beer, or go get coffee, or whatever. But it's easier for him to say, "Let's record the conversation," and now I can link it to people when they ask me the same questions. Right. Yeah, you're giving people something in return effectively rather mm-hmm. than just taking an hour of their time. Yep. And it's not like you could buy them coffee or whatever, but like they don't usually need you to pay for their coffee, you know. So in exchange, giving them something they can share with other people is really, really useful and, and makes it for an easy, much easier way to get to know those people. Then you can stay in touch and then that's how you you know, build friendships. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think you've mentioned the name of your podcast. Yet. <laughs> uh, it's it's a really should... good name though. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, my podcast is called uh, devpath.fm, which is the kind of name you end up with when you decide on Wednesday night and by Thursday have a podcast. Um, but, so I think this podcast is called remote Ruby. I yeah. Mean... Well, that's, you know, people don't ask what does remote Ruby mean? People do ask what does dev path mean? Uh, yeah, I think it's, you know, memorable enough. I remember seeing it before and I didn't connect that it was you until we started <laughs> talking at Southeast Ruby. So yeah, it's, it's funny. Like uh, the, the names can definitely be like uh, dumb at first and you're like, wow, I really picked that for the yeah. name to start with. But you know, over time it really doesn't matter as long as you are doing good work, like yeah. people will remember it. Yeah, and a brand is is totally consistency. So at minimum, like if you just stick with your bad decision for long enough, it will it'll be okay. So um, I'm not <laughs> that angry about it. And I had a I had a really wonderful designer uh, like make a logo and stuff for me and give me some uh, stuff like a, a style usage guide for a bunch of different stuff for branding, which I've probably totally botched. But uh, you know, I, I I'm not that upset with the brand. It's just a, it is a fun name. But yeah, so that's, that's it. it's devpath.fm. The URL is the same thing. Uh, it's on like every streaming thing because I am going to plug somebody else's company right now that I don't know. But I use Transistor, which uh, is awesome for like saving effort. Um, I, I, I'm on like 15 different podcast indication apps and I didn't do anything. I just like <laughs> put the link in. Like it's pretty cool. Yeah, we use Transistor and it works fantastic. And Zencaster as well for recording. Um, yeah. It was yeah. nice when, when we sat down to record and it was like, oh, this is just like every week, except <laughs> for when my internet dropped out like four times in the middle of yeah. recording. <laughs> yeah, but Zencaster hey, kind of handled that too, though, with the, like, the local yeah. back. It, and it, it's, it's, a great it's a good job. service. Yeah, so yeah. I don't know anyone that works with those companies, so I just kind of plug them, uh, but they're awesome. So I use them. They, they save a lot of effort. Um, so I wouldn't advise anyone to go out and start a podcast, but if you do, uh, those are good tools for it. Yeah, it's a lot more work than it seems and <laughs> we do i think we do less work than the average podcast uh with our very minimal recording and editing and all that but even then like there's required work that you got to do and you definitely have to sit down and schedule stuff and make sure you record every week as best as you can and yeah it is uh i don't know that i would recommend recording a <laughs> podcast either but yeah. uh if you, is, if you really want to it's great but if you don't really want to don't do it yeah you can you can get in other ways like if you want to you know 
you don't necessarily have to um, record a podcast if you want to meet people. You can actually ask to interview them over email, mm-hmm. and then they can just reply to your questions whenever they want. Yeah, which is you know another option you could do and post those to your medium blog or whatever. And you know, there's lots of creative ways you can do this kind of thing. But yeah, um, I I pretty much had the same kind of thing. I would I would go and hang out at. Um, startup weekends and other startup events in St. Louis and just got to know pretty much everybody in the community. And I, I that was really good for me because I was consulting at the time. Like that led to, you know, referral after referral for programming work, which was good, but I haven't really been involved in it for a long time. And this is bringing me back to like, I should probably get more involved. It's just now that I'm not consulting, I don't necessarily know that like getting involved with more people locally is that important to me, but meeting people who are just good at wherever they exist is probably the the strategy I need to take, you mm-hmm. know, which is what we're going to do here all the time. Like we got to talk to DHH on the podcast, which is super fun. And like, mm-hmm. we wouldn't have any excuse to talk to him otherwise for an hour. So that was like, you know, a great thing to be like, man, we've recorded podcasts for a year now or whatever. And we've already got to interview one of our like heroes or whatever. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's exactly what my podcast. I literally describe it to people as me uh, asking my heroes really hard questions. And and people always say, like, don't meet your heroes or whatever. That's kind of stupid. Um, you should you should humanize your heroes, which has been really effective for me, which is what, what I'm doing. I'm, I'm meeting people that I put on a pedestal and then I'm kind of uh, they're still really impressive people and really smart people, but I'm kind of taking them off that pedestal and saying like, no, you're just a person. Um, and like what you've done is not, uh, doesn't make you, you know, a, a demigod. You're just a normal person and you have normal problems. But I also have the benefit of like learning from them because they are very successful and, and very interesting people. Yep. Yeah. But you do, you lose your like fairy tale, tale story yeah, which, to them. Yeah. In my opinion, that's a huge fuel for imposter syndrome. So you should get rid of that fairy tale. <laughs> <laughs> that's the right answer. Yeah. Well, um, I don't want to keep you any longer. This is super fun. I'm glad we got to record. And if anybody wants to listen to our interview, it's on your website, devpath.fm. Talks a lot about like just my really early days in programming back when I was like teaching myself and everything took forever to learn. Um, So yeah, you guys can check that out. Where else can I find you on Twitter? Yeah. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to get to Twitter. Um, I'd never really used it. So whatever, Um, but I'm starting to use it now. And my Twitter handle is at Jake Carrington. It's the only place on the internet where my name is Jake because Jacob Harrington's taken by a suspended account and Twitter won't give it to me. Um, but then I also have a blog, which is jh.codes. Um, most of the stuff that I post on my blog is also not all of it, but most of it is also on dev two. So if you're a dev two user, I'm on there too. And I'm Jacob Harrington on that one and Jacob Harrington on GitHub. So pretty much anything Jacob Harrington, it's all the same profile picture. So (laughs) we'll know you by the profile picture. Yeah. My wife's a photographer. So I, but ironically, I only have that one good picture. (laughs) <laughs> that's hilarious well uh i think that wraps it up jason you have anything else i do not cool i guess we'll talk to you next week awesome thanks guys